I want to start with a, a counterfactual. Um, when you bought the Sacramento Kings, bought the Kings 2013, I think it was, you had to sell a, a limited partnership in the Golden State Warriors. And you tried not to. You went to the league, you told me this, uh, and said, could I put it in a blind trust maybe? And they said no. And so you sold to Mark Stevens, who some of you may know, uh, when Kyle Lowry went crashing into the sideline, uh, he shoved him, was fined half a million dollars and banned from uh, Golden State Warriors Arena. So it could have been you on the sideline there, and I'm sure you would have been very courteous, um, and we could have saved all that trouble. But I wonder, do you ever look back and think, minority owner of Golden State Warriors is a pretty good gig, I missed that, that might be cool, or is it just that much better to, to be the boss in Sacramento? You know, when uh, David Stern first approached me uh -huh. about uh, buying the Kings, I, I live in Silicon Valley, and uh, you know, we had owned the Warriors for a couple of years, and we'd been booed, mm -hmm. and we had just started getting uh, right. good at that time. And so my initial reaction was that, you know, why would I do that? I, I live here, these are my friends. Uh, but uh, I saw the passion of the fans in Sacramento, uh, and I'm an immigrant to this country. I came here with nothing. I, I came to California with zero dollars in my pocket. And so everything I have, I owe to the state of California. Mm -hmm. And Sacramento is the state capital. And without the team, there's really nothing there. Uh, so me, it, uh, for me, it was something that I felt I was meant to do. Uh, and it's a huge privilege, and it's a huge honor. Uh, so uh, no, I, I, you know, I think it's great, the success that they've had. Uh, but uh, no, it's, uh, you know, I, I love what I'm doing. No regrets. Uh, I, I did want to say to Andre, Andre, thanks for having me. But I've been trying to get this guy, you know, he likes the big blue corporation. Uh -huh. And I've been trying to get him to come to the purple startup up the road. But he just is like, he's a bureaucrat. Yeah. You know, he likes big, big companies. Do you feel like, on that note, you have what you need to compete? I was looking it up. There's actually, I think, nine markets smaller than Sacramento, which surprised me in the NBA. But, but still, you're on the small end. Do you feel like you, the league has set it up in a way that you can compete if you execute a plan? Yeah, and I actually chair the planning committee, which uh, looks at uh, things like revenue share. And uh, so a team like the Warriors, which is in a very wealthy market, you know, could do like 180 million more in revenue, mm -hmm. which is a realistic number. And half of that goes to the players. So 90 of it has to go to the players. Uh, but Joe only has to pay three of that 90. The other 87 comes from the other 29 teams. So it actually drives the payroll of all the other teams up. Uh, so I think that the league has done a really good job of uh, sharing revenues and uh, trying to level the playing field. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think uh, that, yes, you know, small markets can, can compete, as we've seen in the case of uh, uh, teams like the Spurs. And in October, you are going to, the Kings are playing the first uh, against the Pacers preseason game ever in India, in Mumbai. That's correct. Two games there. You have been an advocate. You're born in India, first NBA owner from India, of growing the game globally, but especially there. And I'm curious what you think about the strategy uh, that works best. Is this about finding India's Yao Ming? Is this about uh, putting a team there eventually? Is this about more maybe playing a regular season game there? Is it about media deals, teaching the game? All of the above. What do you prioritize as you try? Yeah, it, it's it, there's no single silver bullet, so you have to do it all. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Kings were actually the first team to play in China in 2004. Uh, and now we're going to be the first team to actually play a real preseason game in India uh, in 2019. So 15 years later, uh, there's over 300 million people in China that now play basketball. Uh, when I first bought the Kings, uh, Adam Silver had made a promise to me that. Uh, the, one of the first things he would do is go, uh, go to India with me. Uh, so in 2013, I think, or 14, uh, we went to India together to Bombay, my hometown, uh, and we launched uh, our youth program there. Uh, and since that time, we now have 10 million little boys and girls uh, playing basketball in India. Uh, it's become one of the fastest growing sports uh, over there. Mm -hmm. Last year, we had 130 million viewers uh, in India. Uh, so this is going to be the next uh, great market. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, President Obama is doing the same thing in Africa. He's uh, partnered with the NBA. Uh, so that'll be another great market. Uh, but you have to do it all. So we, yeah, you have to, we have clinics uh, we conduct. Uh, we send players there. We send members, ambassadors there. Uh, we, uh, at the Kings, we have a Hindi 
uh, website. Uh, we have uh, the lettering on the court uh, is, is in Hindi on, mm -hmm. uh, for some of our games. You do a Bollywood night? We do a Bollywood night, which I actually started at the, at the Warriors. And uh, we broadcast our games uh, in, in, in India, many of them in VR. So it's like sitting in my uh, seats. Uh, and so you have to do it all, but we think it's going to be a huge uh, market. Is it cricket, basketball, or is soccer in there? What do you? Yeah, think? so it's yeah, it's soccer and basketball. Right. Yeah, so soccer's been there longer, uh, but basketball is is going fast. Uh, and we'll never pass up cricket as the national pastime. That's mm -hmm. kind of the national pastime there. Uh, but I think being number two mm -hmm. is still a gigantic market. Right. I want to revive an old debate uh, between you and Mark Cuban about the in-arena experience. Um, I did a piece maybe five years ago just sort of setting you two on different poles, where you were the owner who wanted everyone to have an app in their pocket that could give them stats and act, get, buy merchandise and find out which is the shortest line for beer and everything. Uh, and he was the guy who said, put your phone away spend this time watching the game uh, and use your hands for clapping. Um, and uh, I wonder, and he said when he got into the league, he was like you, and then he realized the error of his ways. And I wonder if you have changed at all uh, since taking over, and what you think fans want in the arena, both, you know, more kind of when the game's not on, during timeout, halftime, but, but in general, what do you think they want out of an arena experience? Well, this is like one of my favorite pastimes, is beating up on Cuban, <laughs> because the guy is like a Luddite. He pretends to be like a tech guy. Right. But I told him, I said, Mark, People look at their phones 300 times a day, whether you mm -hmm. like it or not. 90% of the people who watch TV are looking at the phone at the same time. Uh, so this is a fact of life. Mm -hmm. This is what they do. Uh, and in our case, uh, our, the phone is really your remote. So it helps you get to the game. It helps you find parking. Uh, you don't have to. It helps you get in the arena. It helps you find your seat. Uh, you can order food. You can adjust the temperature. Uh, you can make bets. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see different views. Uh, so it's really the, the remote uh, for your experience. Uh, and, uh, and actually, when Mark said that, I don't know if you were there, but I put up a picture. And I said, hey, look, look there's a guy there on his phone in your arena. And right. it was him. Right. <laughs> so, so that's just not even a debate anymore. Right. I think uh, the next time you see him, he'll, be, he'll have a white flag on him because it's <laughs> over. He, he lost that one. You mentioned betting on your phone. You guys, it's not yet a thing in California, but you have yeah. made first steps toward that with an in-play, free-to-play uh, right. prediction game that you partnered with MGM. Right. That's, you can do mobile, and then you put a lounge uh, in the arena yeah. for players to go and play this. Why did you do that? What have you learned from it? Uh, and, and is that, in fact, a first step toward, if, if it becomes legal, having betting in your arena? Yeah, so we started doing this three years ago, and we think that this is going to, again, I think it's going to double the value of the franchises, because this is a massive opportunity. Uh, and, and right now, there's hundreds of billions of dollars of betting that goes on, but it's illegal. And so legalizing it will bring it into the sunshine, and we'll be able to put controls around it. Uh, so we launched on our app something called Call the Shot three years ago. Uh, and as long as there's some skill involved and there's no money, then you can do it uh, in the state of California. Uh, and we've had huge success and a uh, very high participation rate with it. Uh, and then this, at uh, the end of the last season, we actually created a physical uh, lounge in our Skyloft where you can go and it's kind of a cross between an Apple store and a trading floor mm -hmm. where uh, we have experts who can help you place bets. Uh, and interestingly enough, 70% of the people that come in there are women. Uh, and we've had great success with that mm -hmm. as well. So we see this as a massive opportunity. Uh, we think that uh, this is yet another way to, to engage uh, people and to entertain. Uh, are, are there, was there any fear or hesitation? I mean, you mentioned there's 70% women. Anybody who's ever been in, in like an off-track betting parlor in New York when that was a thing, it's a kind of a seedy scene. Uh, I was at a game in Las Vegas, uh, the Las Vegas, the Golden Knights, and they were telling me that there, when the, uh, when the Knights beat the spread, uh, the crowd goes nuts. You know, there's a cheer that's not about the, who's winning the game. It's about who's covering their bets. Um, do you want that in the arena? Is there any fear of what you're bringing in when you bring gambling in? Yeah, no, ours, uh, we have a very high-end uh, lounge that we've created. And 
it's uh, no, not not really. It's mm -hmm. just a way to get people more involved, to get them to participate more. Uh, and the data shows that people who do that tend to be much more engaged, mm -hmm. uh, even uh, beyond the uh, game uh, right. action itself. And then I wanted to ask you too about um, sort of the you are willing with the betting your. And in general, it seems to me to sort of try anything. Uh, you guys have, I think, sold tickets on Bitcoin. You did VR in the arena, which was sort of a brain twister for me. You did um, crowdsourcing. You played around with crowdsourcing your draft strategy. And, and this all comes under the rubric of what you call basketball 3.0. Is What is the unifying, what's the strategy here? And what have you learned as you try these different things? Uh, you, you're sort of making your team into a test bed for all kinds of stuff. Yeah, no, it's it's more that when I bought the team, I, I laid out a mission statement for the team, and you know, just like any tech guy does, and and the mission was to build a winning franchise that uh, enhanced uh, the lives of those it touched and made the world a better place. Uh, so we've lived. Uh, if you see our track record and the things we've done in the community, uh, and what we're doing globally, uh, we've done that. Uh, and the whole vision of NBA 3.0 that I had sold the league on was that it would be driven by three vectors, and one of those was technology. Uh, when I first became an entrepreneur, uh, my, uh, everyone back then wanted Goldman Sachs as a first customer, and, mm -hmm. and Goldman Sachs was my first customer. Uh, today, people want uh, an arena, a sports team, uh, Andre Iguodala as a, as a first customer. Uh, and so athletes, and in particular basketball players, uh, Shaq was one of the guys that popularized uh, Twitter early on. He still has a piece of the Kings? or he's, Yes, he's still a partner. Uh, and so we see that we sit right at the intersection of, of technology and sports and entertainment, and it's all, it's all coming together. And mm -hmm. Meg talked about LA and, and the Bay Area and how those are merging uh, as well. Uh, so the Kings, uh, one of our core values is that we're, uh, uh, we, we have open minds. Mm -hmm. so, uh, if there's things that uh, we need to look at or we need to try, right. um, then you know, we do that. Right. We became the first team to uh, try 5G last year, and we're going to need that as we uh, do more sports betting and other kinds of applications. Um, our arena is the only elite platinum arena in the world. It's uh, completely off the grid, so it's 100% solar powered. And I've seen that it's basically a data center underneath there. Yeah, it's, uh, people have called it a, a Tesla, basically. So it's, uh, we've got a, the same kind of class of data center that a Facebook or a Google might have. Uh, so it's heavily technology driven. It's a completely frictionless experience, and so we can uh, literally redirect traffic so that there's no friction uh, when, you, uh, when you come to, uh, to a game. Are there things, though, how do you evaluate, you try this, you're willing to try anything, how do you go, you know what, actually there's no demand for this, or this doesn't really work, or what's the process there? Well, in Silicon Valley, we have this fail fast uh, philosophy. Right, right. So, you know, we have a, a very capable technical team, and, uh, you know, we're, we're going to uh, open a, a host store uh, when the season opens, mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to remove friction even more. So you can go into a store, get stuff, and walk out. Right. You don't have to wait in line. You don't have to go to a check, uh, checkout counter. Uh, so. And, and by the way, we share all of this with all the other teams. You know? So at the end of the day, we're all partners. Uh, and even uh, you know, when teams are building new arenas, we share our own experience and, and what we've learned from what we've tried. Right. You know, you, we're talking about players now are very sought after, uh, both as business partners, but also the NBA has become known as a league that wants its players to use that platform to speak. Um, and you had. Uh, there was a shooting, a tragic shooting in Sacramento in March of 2018. Police shot a young black man. Uh, and you had protests outside the arena actually disrupted. And you took the floor that night with your players and said that you were going to work really hard to keep anything like that from happening again. So I wonder if you could tell us what you've been doing to do that and kind of what are the results that you've seen. Yeah, so I made a commitment to the city and the community that we would work hard. Uh, to bring people together. Uh, and uh, so it's been about a year now since I made that commitment. And uh, we've uh, launched a, a youth league where we've had a couple of hundred people, uh, kids from uh, disadvantaged uh, areas join. And we've had a 100% retention rate. Uh, we've conducted STEM workshops. Uh, we've uh, created a, a league. We've uh, partnered with other teams like the Bucks. Uh, we had an event called Team Up for Change. Uh, 
we had something called Rally the Vote, where we uh, were responsible for uh, driving thousands and even millions of people uh, to, to easily uh, register. Uh, and then we measured uh, the success we've had from that. So youth and youth violence has actually uh, gone way down as a result. Uh, and this is still very much a work in progress. And really the goal is that we want uh, every uh, kid in the city uh, to have access to the digital future. Uh, so we partnered with, uh, with Silicon Valley companies and local companies uh, so that uh, these kids uh, can get training, they can get mentorship, uh, and they can get opportunities uh, to be part of uh, what's driving the 21st century. I wonder, I mean, it seems like the league in general uh, is, is encourages activism. If LeBron wants to call the president a bum, that's fine with Adam Silver. But there are still some bright lines that, uh, that you can't cross. Like the league has a rule on the books that you got to be standing during the national anthem. Just to, I guess, put you on the spot here, what, what do you do if one of your players doesn't want to stand during the national anthem? Yeah, so we, we're, we're blessed to have amazing leadership. Uh, it was David Stern and now uh, Adam Silver. Uh, we also have amazing players. Uh, they're not just incredible athletes, but they're incredible human beings. And they uh, truly care, mm -hmm. and they're willing to, uh, to get involved. Uh, and they know that they have a voice, and they know that uh, we have an ongoing dialogue. Uh, so we actually brought uh, our players, inner city youth, uh, the police force, we brought them all together uh, so that they could converse. Uh, when, I, when, I was a, when I was a little boy in, uh, in Bombay, uh, one day I woke up in the morning and my father had been uh, picked up in the middle of the night by the police and put in jail. And I saw a picture of him on the front page sitting on a little stool uh, in a jail cell. And the reason he was put in jail is because he spoke his mind. And so as an immigrant, I value uh, freedom of speech. And uh, you know, to me, it's, it's a core value that the U.S. stands for. Uh, so I personally will never demonize anyone uh, for exercising uh, that right. But, but you know, players haven't felt the need because they have a voice. Right. And, uh, and whatever we do, we do together. And you know, you saw Harrison earlier, and you know, he's, he's an amazing guy. And of course, Andre is amazing. So uh, these are all uh, people that truly care uh, about others, and they care about uh, the future of this country. And you have now uh, become, uh, you know, you founded Tibco, you, you bought the Kings, you got that arena done, and now you've sort of ventured into, uh, you started a venture capital fund, Bow Capital, which okay. is with uh, the University of California. And I'm curious if you, you know, could just, I know a little bit about it, but let people know here about how that works with the University of California and how you invest. Sure. Yeah, so I see the next 10, 20 years, we're going to see the biggest wealth creation opportunity in the history of mankind. So we're entering a new era. I call it Civilization 3.0. So 1.0 was the agricultural era. That was the start of modern civilization. And land was the raw material. People were farmers, shopkeepers, carpenters. Then with the Industrial Revolution, it was 2.0. And it was the age of the corporation. And energy and steel were the raw materials. Uh, we're now entering a time where the world's largest bookseller has no bookstores. And the world's largest taxi company has no cars. And the world's largest hotel has no real estate. So it's really the digital era. And as we go from 2.0 to 3.0, there's going to be trillions and trillions of dollars of new industries and new opportunities created. Now, much of this is going to be uh, driven by technology. Uh, so I was approached by the UC a few years ago uh, to partner with them in, in starting a fund. Uh, and, um, and I had no prior experience in that. I had been lucky. You know, I had, uh, the, one of the first Google deals was done at my Christmas party, so I had been lucky with some deals. Uh, but uh, what I was amazed at is how uh, prolific the 10 campus uh, UC research system was. It's the largest research platform in the world. Uh, they you know, generate more patents than anyone. Uh, and they cover areas which are going to change for the better mankind. Uh, so I agreed to launch this fund. And there's only two investors, them and me. Uh, BOW stands for Better Our World. Uh, and we believe that we can use technology to advance uh, society and make the world better. I also get early access and first dibs on uh, technologies and companies that come out of this very rich uh, 10 campus uh, UC system. 
Uh, and what I see is a number of these trillion dollar sectors which didn't exist 10 years ago. So, you know, take gene editing, CRISPR-Cas9, which was invented at Berkeley. Uh, so this is a way to cut and paste gene sequences so you'll be able to eliminate whole diseases. So you'll be able to get a shot in your thigh and muscular dystrophy, gone. So this is going to be a trillion dollar sector. You know, microbiome. Uh, the universe is like 14 billion years old, the Earth is four and a half billion years old, and bacteria are like you know, three and a half billion years old. So it turns out that we have a trillion bacteria in our gut and they control all our health. So in the future, you know, people are gonna be able to be invested in a company where babies can take this probiotic uh, and it can uh, cure certain ailments uh, because of, uh, of the gut bacteria. Uh, new materials. And so there's a material called graphene, which didn't exist a while back. Uh, it's, the, it's an atom thick. And in the future, everything will be made out of graphene. TV screens, airplanes, cars, bicycles, ice hockey sticks. Uh, but you'll also be able to take salt water, pour it, and sweet water will come out of it. Uh, so that's going to be another trillion dollar sector when somebody figures out how to make it. So what we see is this massive opportunity uh, coming out of uh, what's happening in universities and, and other places. Mm -hmm. And so that is the strategy. You're going for the biggest bets. We're, we're going for, term. yeah, we think there's a bunch of these trillion dollar sectors uh, and, uh, and most of the companies are going to come from three sources and one of the biggest of those three is the university system. And the other, the other two, I think you told me. Well, we, we're very uh, closely, we work with uh, the Y Combinator companies, and companies like Airbnb came out of that. And then the third is just this mafia of people that have started these companies and work together. Uh, and uh, they're coming from places like India and China uh, as well. Uh, we have a few minutes left. I'll open it up to questions. Please wait for the mic if you have a question. Um, anybody? Can't see. Oh, there we go. Uh, be back, guys. Uh, thank you for uh, coming to the conference today. I have a question about 5G. Is Sacramento is one of the primary locations for 5G rollout. Um, some people have expressed some concerns, health concerns about 5G. Um, what do you think about any potential health concerns, and do you? Um, see that changing uh, the rollout of 5G? Yeah, we haven't seen any uh, you know, real scientific evidence to, uh, to support that. Uh, you know, I think somebody said that windmills cause cancer too, so uh, uh, you know, we, you know, we take health concerns very seriously and you know, we're open to input, but we haven't seen uh, any of that. Uh, we think there's a huge appetite for 5G uh, and we're going to be the first team to actually roll it out in our arena. We were the first team to try it out. Uh, and it's going to just open doors to even more uh, opportunity uh, to the young people in Sacramento. Anybody else? Right here. Oh, I guess here first. Okay. Vivek, um, AI is mostly is going to eliminate between 100 to 300 million jobs in the next 10 to 15 years. Some number says. 300 more. From a technology point of view, if you don't have a, a college degree or highly educated, what's going to happen to those jobs that uh, are going to be eliminated? What's your view, especially that you're driving that type of uh, technology change? Yeah, you, you know, that's uh, a few years ago when, uh, the, uh, when President Obama went uh, uh, to India, he took me with him, and we spent basically three days uh, talking about that. And uh, so, yes, I think AI is going to uh, disrupt uh, just about every sector and every industry, and uh, you know, that's going to cause dislocation in the short term. Uh, and, and the power of AI is, is truly mind-boggling. And so, you know, there's like 10 raised to 70 atoms in the universe. You know, that's as big a number as you can think of. And yet there's like 10 raised to 170 possible combinations in the game of Go. And computers can now beat the world Go champions like a drum every single time. So if, it, if that's possible and autonomous cars are possible, then what is impossible? Uh, but I do think 
that there'll be new uh, industries and new jobs uh, that are created. Uh, and I do think that our education system is one of the trillion dollar opportunities that I see. It's going to be massively disrupted. Uh, so people are going to be able to get educated without spending a dime. And we're investing in companies. There's a company called Lambda School we invested in that basically offers an education for free uh, and makes you into a programmer. And then they take a cut of your future salary. Uh, so I think that the education system gets disrupted. There's no law that says you have to pay a lot of money and go to a school for four years. Uh, you know, it could be done in small increments, and it could be done uh, based on uh, areas that you learn, so it doesn't have to be like this big program. So a combination of a reinvention of education, a combination of uh, new uh, opportunities emerging, uh, and, uh, and then I think that there will be some period of disruption, uh, but uh, you know, we have the lowest unemployment that we've ever had right now, uh, and, and I think Meg said that the big disruptor is uh, you know, it's not free trade, it's, it's, it's technology. So, uh, so I'm, I'm an optimist. I think that there'll be short-term pain, but longer term, it's going to benefit humanity. If you had one more, there was somebody over here. We could do just one more. Is there somebody I saw? No? All right, we're good then. Thank you very much. Thanks.